And uh, uh, good morning to everybody. I'm used to saying good evening, ladies and gentlemen, because I'm normally speaking in the evening. So it's a little bit unusual to say good morning to everybody. Um, I've already been given a very um, substantial introduction, um, so I won't bore you with more facts about myself, other than to say that I've had an enormous privilege uh, to spend the best part of my life uh, on one of the most beautiful parts of, of the British Isles. Um, Mick mentioned uh, earlier on the Bevelin, uh, which has been really my area for working. Um, I discovered the Bevelin when I was a, a lad in school, and uh, immediately I realised that this was a, a top place. Now, for those of you who are not so familiar with it, and I'm sure you all are familiar, um, this is one of the most important uh, specially protected areas we have in Wales. Um, it's 24,000 uh, hectares of wonderful country, much of which is in fact covered by uh, fairly substantial quantities of heather. And that is uh, really what makes it so valuable from an ornithological point of view, particularly for certain special uh, birds uh, and other fauna as well that uh, exists up there. Um, we've already mentioned black grouse, uh, which um, is a, a special bird. I, I can't profess that the Bedouin has the peak numbers of black grouse. You've got to uh, leap across the A5 to find those up on Ruadan Mountain if you want to see big numbers. But we do still have uh, numbers of black grouse and we monitor them every year. Um, I wish they were increasing uh, to the level that they were when I first started back in uh, the mid-70s. Uh, but um, they're holding on, I think, at the moment, uh, it would be fair to say. We've already heard about curlew, um, and uh, this is a, a story which is quite astonishing. Jan has already indicated the uh, incredible outcome from a bird we took for granted uh, all those years ago to one which is a, a special day now where we see a curlew actually on breeding ground. Um, we also have um, a, a complete um, suite of species, uh, birds like windchat, for example, uh, does very well against the backdrop of other upland areas of Britain where uh, windchat is apparently declining. So uh, that gives you a little flavour of some of the, those birds. We also have occasionally short eared owl breeding, but this is very much in relation to the vole populations. I have uh, years where I don't see a short eared owl, and then some years where several of them are around. So uh, that's a little bit about the, the, the background and some of the birds, and there are many more that I haven't mentioned, of course, which all go to make uh, a raptor monitoring person's life even more interesting, aside from the raptors themselves. Um, now this uh, little young, -haired, young long haired upstart was uh, yours truly back in the 1970s. In fact, specifically, this was 1974, uh, this photograph was taken. And at that stage, I had already become pretty well um, uh, um, addicted, I should say, to uh, this area of country, the Bedouin. Um, I had already had my first experience of a hen harrier. And for those of you who have seen hen harrier, I'm sure you all have, um, it's one of those species which um, leaves an indelible impression upon you. Um, the circumstances were not dissimilar to what you can see here. I was out on the moors, uh, scanning around, in fact I think I remember I was looking at a merlin at the time, and I became aware of something approaching me from behind. And I very carefully looked, and it was a male hen harrier. And this was a bird which I had spent my first uh, seven or eight years of life drooling over in bird books, a bird I had never actually seen and never imagined I would. And this bird was tacking uh, towards me in a way that this photograph hopefully depicts. It was a bird which had um, a grace and um, an agility which uh, was unique to harriers. Uh, it was able to use every updraft to um, maximise its chance to inspect the ground beneath it. Um, it could dally for a minute and then it could move on. And all the time the bird appeared to be expending relatively little energy in moving from A to B, using all the facilities of wind and uh, contour of land to help it in its uh, journey. For those of you who have tried to follow a hen harrier, across open moorland, 
their apparently lazy flight um, is in fact extraordinarily fast. Uh, they have an ability to go from A to B which is enviable. For me, uh, to cover the same ground can take um, infinitely longer, and I dream of the day where MRW provides me with a James Bond rocket pack so I can do the same as the male hen harrier here and go effortlessly from A to B rather than thrashing through knee-high heather, which I've done for a long time. Now this is the same long-haired young upstart now wearing his uh, apparently or allegedly fashionable blue jeans and at the time allegedly fashionable blue cheesecloth shirt. But by this stage he had acquired a fairly respectable raptor monitoring pullover to disguise the very otherwise conspicuous outfit that he was wearing. Um, at that stage I had started to become involved with some of my mentors, people like John Norton Roberts, who I'm sure you'll be well aware of, a top man, and also some folks who I had worked with in Devon, the great Robin Kahn who had set up um, the Bird of Prey viewpoint at Holden Forest, um, which some of you will have no doubt been to, and he's a top honey buzzard man, of course. Um, and he was fascinated to come up and see hen harriers, and I was in the lucky position of being able to invite my mentor to come up and actually work with me. And we did for many years do exactly that, uh, pinning down, finding those harriers, and for me it was a great lesson in how to do it, because uh, Robin had spent uh, a lot of time working with Montague's Harriers in Cornwall uh, that had been, right the way through the 60s, a thriving a colony of Montague's in Cornwall and he was applying the very same techniques of locating these birds uh, to hen harriers um, in uh, North Wales and therefore I was the student. And it was a great opportunity for me to learn exactly how to do it. And rather than rush and follow the birds too closely, it soon became apparent that distant working was the way to do it. And this is exactly what we all do today. Those of us who are involved in this kind of work, we sit on a vantage point, we have a good telescope, and we watch behaviour. And it's learning that behaviour which, in fact, uh, is crucial, I think, to the location of the birds in the first place. Anybody who's any, ever done any harrier work will know how able this bird is to fool you into thinking it's doing something and then it doesn't, or it does it over the top of the hill on the other side of the slope. Um, so it can be quite tricky to locate, um, but uh, with enough time and enough effort and determination, it's possible. The hen harrier itself is a glorious bird, as uh, I'm sure you know. And it was the early ornithologists who looked at this bird and were puzzled because the male, of course, with his gold grey plumage and black wingtips, uh, looks so utterly different from the female. Of course, he's designed for uh, being as conspicuous as possible, and it's his mission to fling himself around in the sky um, during the uh, season, particularly the early part of the season when he's staking out his territory, and it's the job of the female and her contrasting uh, livery, uh, which is cryptic, to remain uh, unseen or as unseen as possible. Seen from the underside, the male clearly has uh, um, very, very conspicuous plumage, even more so than the top side. And when this bird is sky dancing, which is the term used, as you know, for the display, this can be uh, very, very eye-catching. And if it's eye-catching for us, you can imagine it will be extremely eye-catching for other harriers. Um, the female, we, um, of course, often use the term ringtail. Uh, when we're unable to distinguish between an uh, adult female, in this case, or indeed an immature bird, either immature um, male or immature female. And it would be uh, a, a, a very experienced harrier watcher who was able to look at a, a distant ringtail and instantly say whether it was a, uh, a male or female immature or an adult female. They are quite hard to separate, and this is why we play safe and use that term ringtail. Um, she, of course, is a ground nester, so um, it pays for her to be as hidden as possible, unlike the male. And given the fact that she does 100% of the brooding of the uh, eggs um, and the young, incubating of the eggs and brooding of the young, then it makes sense for her not to be too obvious. In fact, her ability to hide herself in knee-high heather is as good as any bird I know. 
and any, of, any attempt to cold search a hillside to find a possible nesting pair of hen harriers is usually a waste of time because uh, it would take forever to do that. Instead of which, um, I normally wait to see a food pass, uh, which is uh, a, a good way of, of indicating where the nest is. If you look at her more closely, you can see that she has an owlish uh, appearance to her uh, face. I'm, I'm, my apologies for those of you who are uh, very well versed with all of this. Uh, but for those of you who are not, this is um, a raptor which is somewhere between uh, a, a conventional raptor and an owl, if you like, because the facial structure of a harrier is rather owl-like. And this is no accident, because as they're uh, flying apparently slowly along, peering down at the ground, it's exactly the same technique as is used by uh, some owl species which actually quarter as they're travelling around. Now, the sky dancing process is one of the most extraordinary displays that anybody could ever hope to witness. And for years, I had attempted to photograph hen harriers doing this. Um, but of course, as you can imagine, um, if you get within a sort of photographical distance of a hen harrier sky dancing, it will stop sky dancing because you're too close and it will not behave normally. So to try to do this takes a little bit of doing. And in the end, um, I was more successful actually with a very close relative of our hen harrier, which is the North American counterpart, the Northern Harrier. It was only relatively recently that the Northern Harrier was actually split from the Hen Harrier. So the pictures you're seeing are actually Northern Harrier, but for the purposes of this discussion, the behaviour is absolutely identical as far as the sky dancing behaviour is concerned. Uh, what you can see in this picture is quite extraordinary. The male has reached the top of his roller coaster flight path, and he is about to turn over on the top. And he is, in fact, upside down. He's looking over his shoulder now at the ground. And if you look at the next image, you can see an even more surreal uh, sort of position that this bird has adopted, where his underside is here and his head is completely inverted through, three, through 180 degrees, not 360 degrees. That would be bad news. 180 degrees is, is, he's turned his head through. In order to, I suppose, orientate himself as he's going through this manoeuvre. This would be something which would be impossible to see unless you took still photographs or slowed down movie footage. Uh, and it was only by doing this that I actually realised that they actually went through this extraordinary manoeuvre. I've seen it in action many times but never realised how determined the bird was to show his underside. And that's no surprise because it's the underside which of course is the most conspicuous bit. This is always a good sign when you're monitoring raptors that you've got something happening. So at the very early part of the season, um, and I'm talking here at the front end of April or even late March, I'm out there looking to see if there are birds which appear to be um, on territory, as we would say. Uh, a bird which sits around a lot is another good sign if they uh, seem to be quite comfortable staying in one place which is not the normal behaviour of a bird like a hen harrier, they're normally moving around quite a bit. But once they start to settle in one valley, it starts to give you the feeling that maybe something's going to happen here. So the initial part of that monitoring process involves a lot of careful watching, waiting, uh, observing, and seeing intersex behaviour between uh, the, the, the birds. Uh, here he is again, incidentally, this is now completely ridiculous, Com completely upside down as he's travelling over on that roller coaster path. The sky dancing is done not only by the male, but occasionally by the female as well. It's a, a fallacy to believe this is the sole domain of the male. Um, this particular picture, actually, which is a fairly distant shot, this was in fact um, an immature male who was sky dancing. So occasionally we find uh, brown plumaged males appearing up on the moor who are effectively teenagers, but they still think that they've got it in them to breed, and sometimes they do, uh, but uh, certainly they are happy to give it a go and try and sky dance to see if they can impress the females. I guess if you were going to look at this guy versus uh, a nice white and grey male, uh, and you were a female hen harrier, you'd be more impressed by the latter than the former. 
Very soon after the sky dancing has happened, and there's obvious connection between a male and female, uh, then uh, an awful lot of copulation takes place. It's a very, very regular thing. And then the male starts to search in amongst the heather uh, for a suitable nesting spot. He can land multiple times. And a typical piece of behavior, which is extremely significant for me, is not only seeing food passing going on between the male and the female, but also this very close flying behavior where the male and the female appear to be flying a matter of a few feet from each other. And in fact, this is where the male is trying to goad the female into looking at certain spots in the heather, which he favors. And whether she does is, of course, entirely her prerogative. Um, he might build um, a very crude pad on the ground made of heather sticks. And I've seen several of these built, and the female, for whatever reason, may choose or not to actually uh, get herself um, involved in that particular site. When she does approve of a site, of course, then she starts to contribute to that nest uh, building activity. In fact, it's really the soft furnishings she brings in. So again, this is another significant aspect. If you see nesting material being brought and birds repeatedly landing in uh, the same spot in the heather, then by that stage, I'm pretty certain I've got something going on. At this point, I would never go anywhere near those birds. I would let them carry on. I wouldn't interfere. I would stay 500 yards or more away. And I personally believe that that is the distance you need to be to completely um, take away any risk that the birds are going to object to your presence. If you start getting too much closer, they start to, in some cases, uh, object to you being there. Um, during all that time, the food passing goes on between the male and the female, and clearly it's in his interest to bring the female into good condition for egg production and egg laying. So he will do a regular um, contribution to her, um, and this is done in um, a, an equally flamboyant style to the sky dancing display, where uh, she comes up from the ground, whether she's actually on eggs or whether she's prior to egg laying, she'll come up off the ground and she'll chase the male and uh, more or less force him to drop the food. And he does so dutifully and she catches it expertly in the air and then she goes down and, 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 and takes the food. And this is a piece of behaviour that will happen through the whole season. And it's the one thing that for me absolutely clinches that you've got a territorial pair. When you've got food passing going on, I then tick that box and say, right, I have got a territorial pair. That may or may not lead to egg laying, uh, but it certainly uh, constitutes uh, a territorial pair at that stage. With a bit of luck, it, it does lead to the next stage in the process, and that is, of course, the laying of eggs. Um, this nest you can see in this picture uh, looks fairly conspicuous. Take it from me, it isn't. Uh, it's just the way the photograph was taken. To actually locate these nests, uh, you're, you're nearly on it before you can actually see the nest itself. And in fact, the females um, are remarkably good at staying down on the nest right up until the last minute. I have literally been from here to the screen actually looking at the female sitting on her nest and she's been looking at me and it's a, a, a sort of battle of willpowers and then eventually she'll come off. Now, it doesn't give me any pleasure to cause the female to come off the eggs and, of course, I wouldn't do this if there was any other way of monitoring the young. Having done now over a thousand nest visits to hen harriers, I'm pretty convinced that my activities uh, are not in any way detrimental. I minimise my time at the nest, very quick look. I sometimes mark the eggs so that they're of little or no interest to egg collectors. And indeed, if any other non-licensed person were to come along, they might suspect they were being watched. So that is one of the pieces of action I take to try to minimize human uh, interference. And luckily, uh, touching wood, uh, we have virtually no uh, human interference whatsoever that I can, I'm aware of. Um, eggs uh, are laid, uh, and that can range from as little as two right the way through to uh, the biggest clutch I've ever found was six. Um, that doesn't mean to say that every egg is going to result in a youngster. Sometimes uh, the, uh, you'll get an unhatched egg, an infertile egg, or whatever. Um, 
If everything goes well, then the eggs all hatch, and here are some new hatched youngsters. Again, this is a point where I can tick a very important second box, and that is the number of young that have actually hatched out of those eggs. And at that point there, that will be enough for me then to go away, and knowing how long it will be before I need to go back again and actually determine uh, what the outcome was at the end of that um, uh, brood process. Um, all that time, those young are being fed. Now, in the case of Berlin, we have relatively few red grass, uh, so the issue which we all know about in the north of England um, regarding uh, estate with uh, shooting activity versus harriers, it doesn't actually apply where on my watch. None of the uh, estates are interested in harriers. Uh, they're not out there trying to butcher them, which is a really good help. So we've got a very a good situation in Wales. Um, I dare I say that if the red grouse population increased to the point where it became commercially interesting, we might find that the tables turned again. At the moment, I'm quite happy that red grouse remain fairly scarce. That's quite good. And at the same time, clearly, uh, from the evidence we have, um, harriers have no uh, absolute requirement for grouse. They can subsist on pipits and voles and various other uh, species as well. And the evidence in the nest is irrefutably showing that it's passerines that are being brought in uh, on great regularity. And this is a picture showing young harriers now at about two and a half weeks of age um, actually getting pin feather and it will be no time before they are out of the nest. The incubation here is about 32 days for the eggs and for the young to actually go from egg to fledging is around about 28 days. So it's an extremely fast process. Um, sometimes you find with uh, the egg laying being um, done asynchronously and the uh, incubation happening the minute after the first egg is laid, what happens is that uh, there can be um, a great variation in size of the youngsters. This, is, this would not happen if, of course, the female um, chose not to incubate the eggs until the last egg had been laid. This is what happens with merlins. But with harriers, they incubate as soon as they've laid the first egg. And that means that you've got this potential for a great difference in size. We call this little guy the runt. And um, it would, of course, be extremely tempting to take him out the nest, feed him up a bit, and put him back in again. But, of course, that would be uh, the worst thing you could do. A, it's illegal. And B, uh, that is packed lunch for the remaining brood if food is, for any reason, scarce. So it has an important function. And for four to fledge rather than none is far better than necessarily all five fledging. Um, at the later stage, when they are reaching nearly three to three and a half weeks, you can actually sex them according to eye colour. This is in fact a young female, and her eye remains chocolate brown, whereas the male, uh, you can see here, is already acquiring a sort of grey hue to the iris. So at that point, apart from tarsus thickness, you can actually confidently sex them. So for me, that's pretty well the job done. Now, is that the end of the story? Well, surely not, because there are dangers, even without human beings on this scene, there are dangers from other predators. Um, I look at the increasing population of common buzzards as fond as I am of all raptors, and I'm looking at these common buzzards now, sometimes uh, 12 hanging over a hillside, uh, looking down on the very banks that harriers and merlins are nesting on, and I do hope I never see what I fear I'm going to, and that is a buzzard dropping in and taking young carriers out of the nest or young merlins. I don't think it's beyond them to do so. We've also got an increasing population of red kites. Now, luckily, harriers are pretty intolerant of intruders uh, because uh, uh, they are built that way. Some female harriers and male harriers are more aggressive than, than others. Uh, when they are aggressive, it's uh, one of the most intimidating factors that you can imagine. 
and for um, a licensed raptor worker, um, it can be actually quite difficult to make your way to the nest when particularly a, a very aggressive female, the larger of the two sexes, is heading towards you uh, in a meaningful manner. And even if I take my license out of my pocket and show it to her, it doesn't seem to make any difference. You know, she still carries on. This is a picture of the top of my head, having been well and truly raped by a female harrier uh, some time ago. Uh, if you, for a minute, take your eye off these birds, they have the skill of actually getting you. Um, so, um, I've mentioned a few of the threats. Well, the grouse situation is not a difficulty in, in, in North Wales. Um, because we don't have enough for the shooters to be concerned about harriers, that's the good news. Um, we have a few, and it would be completely wrong for me to say that harriers don't take grouse. Of course they do, the evidence is here. This picture shows you a young grouse uh, in the nest. And this is the kind of thing that happens normally, in my experience, very late in the season, when the young are on the point of fledging. And at that point, the female then goes out and she's hunting, and she's bringing back, actually, sometimes well-grown grouse. So occasionally I get the odd fully-grown grouse brought in. But it's, it's fairly scarce. Most of the time, the prey items are uh, much smaller than that. We know from all the literature and the tagging studies that were done um, in the early 90s that there is a black hole into which carriers are dropping. Um, you'll remember the Langham study, um, which uh, undertook to look at the impact of harriers on um, shootable surplus of grouse. Well, there was also a study in the 90s looking at the disappearance of female harriers. This was uh, monitored by means of wing tags. And it showed that the survival rate of a female harrier on a managed grouse moor between one year and the next was only 22% thanks to the gamekeeper being present. And you compare that with the uh, survival rate of a female harrier on a non-managed grouse moor, in other words, with no gamekeeper, and the rate was 68%. So it was a massive and significant difference, proving beyond all doubt that this was happening, this was going on. Uh, luckily, as I say, on my watch, um, the only real major problems are natural problems. This was a female harrier um, I found a few years ago, she virtually fledged her young off and she was waiting for food to come in. I went back and looked for her and I thought, where's she gone? The male is coming in trying to food pass. And uh, I saw a wing come out of the ground, flapping around. And clearly she was in distress. So over I went and I found her with virtually the whole of her uh, bone of her wing projecting through the wing. Uh, her wing had been hopelessly smashed. Now, I don't believe that that was a human doing it. I believe that this was an animal, and it could have been a fox, but also it could have been somebody's dog yomping across the moor where the female went into attack and the dog had a go at the female harrier. Who knows? But it's mainly natural circumstances which are the problems. This year, I had, you'll be pleased to know, and Yon has already given you some data on this, I had the most extraordinary number of pairs attempting to breed. Altogether, um, it was 14 pairs on my patch, and that doesn't include vermin. Um, from those 14 pairs, it was uh, actually 60 eggs that were laid, but only 20 young fledged from those 60 eggs. And this was uh, a combination of factors where birds fail to fledge their eggs, or fail to catch their eggs, I should say, or fail to fledge their young for reasons usually to do with weather. And the one thing that I've learned about harriers over the years is how vulnerable they are to bad weather. And if you get a short spell of really bad weather, at the crucial time, it can be curtains for young harriers. So this is why I'm all in favour of minimising the time at the nest, because I'm always thinking to myself, when I'm at the nest, a bird adult could be trying to bring food in. And of course, if they see an intruder at the nest, they'll drop the food and they'll try and defend the nest. So I always wait until food has been delivered, then go in on the nest, and then get out as quickly as I possibly can to ensure that I don't in any way negatively affect the food coming into the nest. Now, the other raptor... Five minutes. Five minutes. I, that's fine. Uh, the other raptor that I do uh, a lot of work on is Merlin. Uh, how could you do uh, monitoring of carriers without monitoring Merlins? They share exactly the same territory. 
Um, and the male, in, uh, in contrast to the hen herring on my watch, is having a far more difficult time. We don't know the reasons why. Uh, the bird, as I said, uh, likes heather, which is knee-high. It particularly likes a gradient. It, it likes to nest under the heather, so they're even more difficult to find sometimes than, than hen herrings. And also being small and inconspicuous, they are uh, um, you know, particularly easy to evade the eye. They sometimes nest on little cliff edges, and this contrasts interestingly with Iceland, uh, where this photograph was taken. Uh, and uh, in Iceland, the uh, race of Merlin that's in Iceland is a cliff nester. It, it doesn't actually seem to nest on the ground like ours does. Virtually all of my pairs are nesting in heather moorland. Now, that doesn't rule out the possibility that some could be nesting in forestry, and I've always kept my eye on the forestry, but yet to find in forestry of this nature any breeding pairs of Merlins. I know that this happens in Mid Wales, but it hasn't happened on, on, on my area to my knowledge. Um, Merlins are astonishingly capable of flying fast after their prey. They have an ability to twist and turn in the air like few other raptors. And perhaps for this reason, although they are sharing and overlapping in their diet with hen harriers, their totally different hunting styles possibly uh, minimise conflict between the two. And actually, interestingly, I often find merlins nesting ludicrously close to hen harriers, almost as if they chose to do this consciously. Um, the female here shows you the squared off tail, fairly lengthy tail of a merlin, which enables it to actually uh, maneuver uh, in the sky. We sometimes have young male merlins uh, actually breeding successfully. This is a second calendar year male who produced four young, so it's not outside of the possibility of a bird which hasn't reached full adult plumage to do that. A pipit's feature very highly in the diet, and the male will bring pipits in, the female will augment her diet with egg and moths and other easy to catch prey. Um, I'm the only person I know who's managed to photograph the three-legged merlin. Uh, this is it. In fact, this is a nestling, which is an interesting piece of behaviour. Merlins occasionally do take nestlings. And here's a female having received uh, the contribution from the male. Again, the whole process is about bringing the female into condition. Luckily, merlins do two things which are very useful. They're very noisy uh, in the breeding season, and also they leave litter. And a merlin plucking place is a sure sign that something is going on, uh, even if you don't see the birds. So that helps in the process of tracking them down. Um, usually, the average clutch is around four, sometimes five. Um, and this is a couple of young Merlins having been uh, fledged off, or nearly fledged off, I should say. This is one actually uh, having fledged. Um, the problem we've got with Merlins, uh, if you can see the figures here, um, is uh, a, 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 an inexplicable one. Uh, if you go back to uh, a point in time around here, you'll see 2002, there were in fact 11 um, uh, uh, breeding attempts um, and if you work your way along that line, you'll see how that 11 breeding attempts very quickly drop down uh, all the way through here. Now, uh, if you look at subsequent or similar places in the UK, there is a similar story. Uh, a study was published in, the, in British Birds recently showing that the Lammermuir Hills population was showing a similar decline. Could it be peregrines? I don't think so, because those peregrines have been there all the time. They were there in 2002. What caused that peak, and more importantly, what caused the decline, is something that needs to be investigated. And Ian Johnston from RSPB is in fact doing exactly that. Going back now to basics, looking at all the data, not only from Wales, but also comparing with other parts of the UK. I hear a lot of rhetoric about goshawks. Um, I'm very aware of the capability of goshawks of taking anything that they want to. Have I seen goshawks very often hunting the moor? Not on my watch. I tend to see them operating primarily in forests, but that doesn't necessarily rule things out. In the meantime, I see my job, and the important part of my job, as uh, continuing, whilst I'm physically capable of doing so, um, of actually keeping a constant monitoring effort across the barrier, making sure that the data sets we have 
is a continuous and a good one, because that then helps us to understand the trends properly. And at the same time, of course, there is a lot of work going on with landowners, and that's where, again, I think I come into the equation. I try very hard to cultivate good relationships with the landowners themselves to make sure that they're aware of what they've got, and they are, after all, custodians of nature reserves at the end of the day. So getting them interested, I think, is an equally important part of the function that I operate. And one hopes, through Raptor study groups, ornithological societies like this, that the folks like myself who can't go on forever are going to be replaced by younger people who uh, feel the same passion uh, to go out there on the lovely moors that I did back in 1975. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Keith, and thanks for the fantastic photos of the two great birds on that lovely pond in one of North Atlantic. I think the, the figures for the decline in the Merlin shows the real importance of long-term monitoring over a single, single area so we can look at trends rather than sort of once every 10 or 20 years that we've tended to do in some areas. So I think that's brilliant bits of data. We've got the same in Middle Isles, our Merlin's a different way of looking at the water. So thank you very much. We're a little bit over time, we've probably got time for one quick question, if anyone's got a question. It was all fairly simple, so I never did get pictures of groups. Okay, thanks very much then, Keith. That was a brilliant start to the day. Uh, we'll now have a short break, if we can come back here in the corner.